وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, we normally on a Tuesday evening have an episode of the Hot Seat Podcast, but we've decided to put that on hold due to recent events. In the past few weeks, we've seen a number of deaths of prominent Salafi scholars. Initially, it started with the death of Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam Ethiopi. A few weeks later, it was Sheikh Falah Ismail Mundakar. And now, as recent as yesterday, we heard the sad news of the passing of Sheikh Ali Hassan al Khalabi. May Allah have mercy on them all. So I'm joined today by Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan, and we want to talk a little bit about the status of the scholars and the death of the scholars as well. What does that mean for us? What kind of lessons can we take from this? And how should our relationship with the scholars be? Because before we know it, sooner or later, we're going to be losing them one by one. And it's important for us to benefit from our time while they're still alive with us on this earth. Ustad Abu Rahman Hassan, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Wa Alaikum Assalamu wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. So as I said in the introduction, uh, we, you know, over the past few weeks, we've heard the, the news, the sad news of the death of some of these prominent Salafi scholars. And uh, yesterday was the most recent one. I think I just want to start the conversation with just a, a personal note you know, how has this news made made you feel over the past few weeks? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Lahu alhamdul hasan, wa thanao al-jameel, wa shadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa hadahu la sharika lah, wa shadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi, wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihzanil ila yawmi deen amma ba'd. The death of the great scholars of Islam is... It's pain and agony, especially if you know the value of knowledge and the people of knowledge. It was narrated that Yahya ibn Ja'far al-Bikandi, rahimahullah, he said, if I had the ability, if Allah had given me the ability to give out my life to someone, I would give it to Muhammad uh, ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim uh, al-Bukhari, rahimahullah. I would give him my life. He said, because my death, he said, is the death of one individual. But he said the death of Imam al-Bukhari is the death of or the absence of knowledge, mm -hmm. knowledge going. And I would love to say the same, but if I had the ability, I had the strength and Allah gave given me it, I would definitely give my life to a man like Muhammad Ali Adam in Ethiopia. Because what he was doing and what he was working on is a, it's something I wouldn't, I mean, I wish, I hope from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And وَمَا كَانَ عَطَاءُ رَبِّكَ مَحْضُورًا Allah's giving is never limited or restricted. But it's something I wish to attain. I need to explain the works or, or the statements of the Messenger alayhi salatu wa Bukhari and Muslim. That's what he was working on. So if he lived, if he lived on, he would have finished off the great kitab, a tirmidhi that he was working on, that he wished to finish. In our religion, Shahid, it honors the concept of knowledge, really. And if you look at the few first verses that came down in the Quran, when Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala said, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, iqra wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi allama bil-qalam, alladhi allama bil-qalam, allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. Allah mentions here something very profound. Many of us don't ponder over it. Allah mentions, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the term iqra twice, mm. which is to read. Yeah. And Allah mentions the word insan twice. Allah is telling the human twice, bringing the word al insan twice. Allah mentions subhanahu wa ta'ala the word uh, al khalq, He mentions it twice. And He mentions the word al ilm twice. Just in those few verses. Mm. Yani, from there you can take straight away that this is a religion that's it's about, uh, it's about knowledge. Islam speaks against ignorance. Mm. Rather, the term ilm, 
يعني اسم مشتقات يعني ذو الواد علم عالمة يعلموا اشتقاقات you know breaking the word down in all of its derived root words of it you find it 850 times in the Quran wow يعني الله mentions it because it's to take the people out of ignorance and the darknesses of ignorance and bring them to, to the light of knowledge so people who've taken that responsibility and upon themselves to learn and to acquire knowledge and the knowledge that we're talking about here is not the worldly knowledge it's the knowledge of the hereafter yeah. um, the knowledge of the akhirah these people it hurts you when you hear their death it touches you it moves you um, and it hurts more when it's a few of them it's not just one when I heard the death of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali Adam Ethiopia Rahimahullah Ta'ala Rahmatan Wasi'a I didn't think I, it would feel as painful as when I then heard Falah Ismail when the car is there and then yesterday when I heard the death of Sheikh uh, Ali Hassan Al Halabi Rahimahullah Rahmatan Wasi'a it hurts even more and more and more and it brings you to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said Hadith Sahihain and Hadith Abdullah bin Amr bin As Inna Allah la yantazi'u al-ilm intiza'an yantazi'u min sudur al-rijal Walakin yantazi'u al-ilm bi qabd al-ulama Hatta ila lam yubqi aliman Yitakhad al-nas ru'us al-juhala Fasu'iru fa'aftaw bi ghayri ilm Fadallu wa adallu Allah does not remove knowledge Inna Allah la yantazi'u al-ilm intiza'an yantazi'u min sudur al-rijal Allah does not remove knowledge But he removes, he removes knowledge by removing its people mm. and then when the scholars pass away and they go that vacuum uh, a people try to fill it pseudo scholars they'll pretend to be like the scholars they don't have the qualification of the scholars the understanding of the scholars so they try to fill that vacuum they try to take that place occupy that seat the people then think okay they, they, they are the scholars and they go to them and they ask them for knowledge or they ask him about religious of the hereafter matters of the hereafter and they give fatwa with no knowledge the first people they misguide is themselves and then they misguide the community and the people so we're living at the time where this hadith is taking place right in front of our eyes the scholars are the senior people that we see today and there are some of them who are still alive, but are we going to benefit from them? Mm-hmm. A lot of our youths and our youngsters are looking up to rappers. And even the ones who are meant to be students of knowledge, talabatul ilm, and the people of khayr, you wouldn't think that we don't listen to music. We don't look up to there are any actors and actresses, but they look up to football players, for example. And that's what they're discussing and that's what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. So it's a sad moment and a sad time. Uh, this particular time, what's happened in COVID-19 this year, the people who've died. First of all, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow his never-ending mercy onto these great scholars of Islam. Mm-hmm. And also I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he doesn't forsake us, that he doesn't يعني, remove these people from us and not replace anyone else uh, with them. Yeah, I think, um, I think the fact that it's happened in such quick succession Obviously, it's a big wake-up call for many, many people. Obviously, within that, you've had the, like you mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic, where a lot of people have lost their loved ones. A lot of people have died in so far this year. Um, and who knows, only Allah knows how many people are going to continue to die uh, between now and the end of the year. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the status of the people of knowledge. You touched on it briefly there. When we see these deaths, particularly for these people of knowledge, um, should we feel the same as when a normal person dies or a person of knowledge dies? Like, what is the different kind of feelings we should have in those situations? The people of knowledge have a greater status. They're not equal to the people who don't know. Allah says in the Quran, Allah Tabarakut here, the scholars, they say, this is Allah is asking a question. He said, Are they the same? The ones who know and the ones who don't know, are they the same? Yani in there is a negation. Yani right. They are not the same. It's like a rhetorical question. Yes, a rhetorical question. Allah is negated, subhanahu wa ta'ala, at taswiyah, yani these two people to be equal. 
And then Allah says after Inna Maya Tadakaru Ulu Alba, the people who take heed, who ponder and contemplate and look at Awaqib al Umur, the ending of matters are those who have insight and knowledge. So we say yes, definitely. Us and the scholars are not the same. And we're ignorant and the scholars are Ahlul Ilm, they're people of knowledge. So of course we're not the same. Allah has negated that subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we die, may Allah have mercy upon Abdul Rahman, may Allah bestow his mercy on him. Like when a alim dies, a big thing happens to the Ummah. Mm. These people, the ulama, Allah has taken them as a witness. Allah used them as a shaheed, uh, as a shuhada, and a testimony. Allah, when you have, uh, uh, you want to go to Jamaa Islamiyya Medina, you يعني, go to the university and this university says, okay, all of this that you told us about yourself, we want somebody who can right. يعني, be a witness for it. So you go and you get the most virtuous of people. You ask them to write you a tizkiyah. يعني, the reason you do that is because that individual, his statement is value for you. Allah used the ulama, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he doesn't need to. But because they, they have a high level, Allah says in the Quran, شَهِدَ اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَأُولُوا الْعِلْمِ قَائِمًا بِالْقِسْطِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Allah says, شهد الله, Allah bears with us. And the thing Allah is using them a witness for shahid, something profound, it's very shocking. It's the most important thing, the reason why we're here in this world. Allah is saying that, شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة. So Allah uses the angels. والملائكة وأولوا العلم قائما بالقسط. Allah, the people of knowledge. And then Allah mentions right after them, the people of knowledge, the ulama. Allah uses them for tawheed. And Allah is saying, I, Allah, does not, I, no one deserves to be, I mean, I don't deserve, or any, no one should worship anyone besides me. And my witness for that is the angels and the Ahlul Ilm. And Imam Al-Qurtuni mentioned something very profound. He said, if there was anyone more virtual, more virtuous than the angels and the people of knowledge, Allah would have used them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this maqam, this maqam, which is azim, he is to use, specifically chosen. Right? So in response to your question, the scholars, there's no one like them. They have something very big. And the early nations, Shahid, when a prophet died, Allah will be another prophet. When the people become corrupted, Allah will bring another prophet. Yani the people of the children of uh, Adam alayhi salam, when they cor got corrupted and they changed and left the way, the Tawheed and the monotheism, Allah brought to Nabi Lahi Nuh. وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ أَلِيهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَسْرًا When they started to worship idols or people they considered to be righteous or that were righteous, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did was he brought Nuh, Nuh alayhi salam. And then when Nuh came to them, uh, Nuh called them to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. وَالْقَدَرْ صَنَّا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِتَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَىٰ خَمْسِينَ عَامًا 950 years he was calling them to Tawheed. And he was saying to them, يَا قَوْمِ عَبُودُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنِ إِلَىٰهِمْ غَيْرُهُ 950 years he was calling them to Tawheed. So now we don't have that. When Nabi Allah Muhammad died, Muhammad صلوات الله وسلم is the last and final prophet. Allah تبارك وتعالى he told us مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّمْ That Muhammad صلوات الله وسلم is the last and final prophet Allah sent. So what's the people we go back to? Who are the people to substitute for us? I need to occupy that seat for us. Yeah. Of course, they're not exactly the same as the prophets and the messengers, but they take the place of those great scholars. They occupy their seat. Uh, and they are the people of knowledge. The Prophet said, كانت بنو إسرائيل تسوسهم الأنبياء بنو إسرائيل The Anbiya used to control their affairs and run their affairs. كلما هلك نبي Every time a Prophet died, another Prophet will come. And then the Prophet said, except that to me, there's no Prophet after me. So there's no Prophet after Nabi Allah Muhammad. These ulama that we see are the inheritors of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet told us in hadith, uh, Imam Ahmed and others narrated it, in hadith Abi Darda, من سلك طريقا يلتمس فيه علما سهل الله له طريقا إلى الجنة. The ending of the hadith, he mentions, وإن العلماء ورثة الأنبياء. That the scholars are the inheritors of the uh, Prophets. وَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ لَمْ يُوَرِّثُوا دِرْحَمًا وَلَا دِينَارًا And the Prophets, they didn't give, they did not pass to the people any currencies and money and gold and silver. What they passed on to the people is إِنَّمَا وَرَّثُوا الْعِلْمِ فَمَنْ أَخَذَهُ أَخَذَهُ بِحَدِّ الْوَاشِرِ 
what they passed on to the people is knowledge and ilm. So Allah raised them because of that, the scholars, because they took that knowledge from the inheritors of the Prophet. Because they took that and they lived by it and they presented it in the correct way without tainting it, without adding their own whims and desires into it. Allah raised them. Allah raised the believers from the disbelievers and then within the believers, Allah raised the, right. the people of knowledge, greater status. Mm. So the ulama, first of all, their qadr and their position is very, very high. Yeah. And uh, the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad Sallallahu was commanded, Allah commanded the Prophet to ask him to increase him in knowledge. There's nothing, if you look at the whole entire Quran, you will never find a Prophet being told to ask Allah to increase him in anything. Except this. Except this. Oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. Mm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's a Prophet. He's already been educated and taught and and he benefits is being brought to him from Allah. Allah is and he educating the Prophet and teaching him. With that being said, he's instructed still to ask Allah for what? To increase him in knowledge. Scholars, mm -hmm. they say this is what? Iyaka'ani wa sma'ya jara. And Allah is talking to the Prophet, but it's not him necessarily that's intended here. Okay. It's us. Everyone. Yeah. It's all of us. So, yeah, and he, uh, the scholars, in line of poetry, they said, Knowledge removes the darkness from the person. The darkness of the heart, knowledge will remove it. The same way that the moon removes the darkness of the night. When the moon comes, it does. If it wasn't for knowledge, souls of the people would not find happiness. And we wouldn't know what is halal from what is haram, we wouldn't. And it's through knowledge that we are saved from humiliation and ignorance in it is where humiliation lies. يعني, I, said this to, I said this to a few brothers before. I said, if you don't learn now, and you become patient with ignorance. You could have taken another path, which is to be patient upon seeking knowledge, mm. which would have brought you honor in dunya wal akhirah. So you got two options because you're saying seeking knowledge is not easy, but you got two options: you either be patient upon that path where seeking knowledge is not easy, but you attain knowledge at the end, or what's harder than that is to be patient upon your ignorance, where every single masala you always have to ask someone, what's the answer to this, what's the answer to this, what's the answer to this? And even some of your private affairs, you have to go to another person to get an answer, and it's just going to be even harder in your life. And yeah, and also, you're also going to be يعني, belittled. Yeah. يعني, you're going to feel a vacuum. People are going to belittle you. يعني, he doesn't know. Yeah. يعني, your whole entire life is going to be يعني, humiliation. That's what you're going to live upon. The poet, he said, Anyone who doesn't, does not taste the bitterness of seeking knowledge for a portion of time, are you going to go through the suffering of ignorance for the rest of your life? Then he said, If you lose off the opportunity of learning when you're young, then make takbir on that person. Even, if, even though he's alive, Consider him dead. فكبر عليه الله. Yeah, make takbir on this person. فكبر عليه أربعة لوفاته. He's dead. Now you four takbirs when somebody dies. This person, even though he's still alive, he's dead. Because Allah تبارك وتعالى, he says uh, in the ayah, أو من كان ميتا فأحييناه. The one who was dead and we gave him life. And he, the revelation, that's what he means. He was dead, يعني his heart was dead. What is it that Allah gave him? Allah gave him the knowledge of the revelation and that's when he became alive. So, and it's important that we take time out. Well, life, you're big, you're old, you're, you're even 50s, you're 60s, and you're ignorant about your religion, you're still young. Mm -hmm. And if you're young and you know the religion of Allah, you're senior, you're old. And age is just a number. Right, right. So many people might be watching this at home and thinking, I want to start treading the path of seeking knowledge. It's difficult in this world. Obviously, there's a lot of different responsibilities that I have, the way the world works. 
It requires me to have a full-time job, pay rent, look after my family. How can one balance the portion of seeking knowledge amongst the other commitments and responsibilities? I and mean, the first thing that we have to understand is that knowledge, the value of it. If you know the value of something, you understand it, then inshallah ta'ala, you'll be able to understand. And it, first of all, read about the virtue of knowledge. Great scholars of Islam have written books on it. Ibn Abdul Barr has a kitab called Jama Bayan al Ilm al Fadri. And Imam Khatib al Baghdadi has a kitab called Jama al Akhlaq al Rawa Adab al Sami. Also, another kitab very Qayyim, which is called Sharaf Ashab al Hadith. Ibn al Qayyim has a kitab called Mustah Dar al Sa'ada, which is very powerful. Ibn Qayyim mentions in that kitab anybody who wants to reach a goal in life, yeah. if you ever want to reach a goal in life, he mentions, Ibn al Qayyim, that you need two things. You will never reach any goal if you, like, even today, coming here, sitting here, preparing the, and getting ready for the recording. All of that, Ibn al Qayyim mentions that if you don't have two things, you'll never do anything in your life. You'll never achieve anything in your life. Mm. What is the first thing? It has to be himmatun turaqi, aspiration. You have to have aspiration for something. You want, you, you have to want to do it. If you don't want to, then no, you're not going to attain anything. The second thing is, uh, or the second quality is that you have the ilmun uh, yubasiru You have knowledge of that thing. If you don't have knowledge, you have knowledge. And you don't have the desire, you're not going to be able to achieve anything. So you have to want to do something, you have to know how to do it as well. Both of them. Mm. And the scholars combine between those two. They have the knowledge, the insight, mm. and also they have the uh, they have the irada, and they have the knowledge and they have the will, the drive, the motivation, the dedication. Like, well, for example, when you see Muhammad Ali Adam in Ethiopia, and he's not young, Sheikh, I mean, late seventies or early eighties, تقريباً, and Muhammad Ali, the Sheikh, is authoring books. يعني ساعات دوار, he has to sit down and read and verify the, the chain from this book to this book. يعني, the question that you ask yourself is how? How are you doing all of this when in reality you're, you're very old in age? It's him, man. Mm. That's high aspiration. And he's de dedicated. Um, Allah mentions, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets to have this quality. Allah wa ta'ala, he says, Ulil aidi wal abasar. Ibn Qayyim Ibn Qayyim mentions, يعني, Ulil aidi wal abasar here means that they combine between knowledge and also aspiration. This is a quality they, that is taken from the prophets. And it's a quality that's taken from the uh, righteous people. So first of all, understand the value of knowledge. The second advice that I can give is you have to have sincerity. Of who are you going to, in order to learn knowledge, you have to be very sincere. If you have ulterior motives, you're not going to learn. The poet, he said, فَالْتَقْصِدُوا أَرْبَعَةً قَبْلَ ابْتِدَى تَعَلَّمْ لِكَيْ تَفُوزَ بِالْهُدَى أولها الخروج من ضلال وثاني نفع خلق ذي الجلال وثالث الأحياء للعلوم والرابع العمل للمعلوم. The poet he said, when you want to seek knowledge, have four intentions and four reasons why you're seeking knowledge. أولها الخروج من ضلال. The first reason is you want to leave in ignorance. You no longer want to be ignorant. You're sick and tired of of saying I don't know. You've understood that. If you just have, يعني, if you just come to this world and you exist and you stay in this world and you're ignorant, no kima, no, no benefit for you. The poet, he said, The people are all the same in terms of their fathers. Your father's a human, my father is also human. Your father, your, who you come from is Adam, I come from Adam. Your mother is originally Hawa, my, 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 my mother is originally. Mm. And the nufus are all the same. Mm. Also, I have limbs, body parts, you have bones, you have veins. Okay, that's it. Your lineage, my lineage, it's all subjective, everything. If we have really something to really praise ourselves for, a real يعني, value that can give me over you or you over me is what? 
It's not. يفخرون به فطين والماء. You can't say the sand that you were made from or the earth that you were made from was lighter than the land that was. I mean, that even there's no value. ما the poet he says ما الفضل إلا لأهل العلم إنهم the virtue is for the people of knowledge. على الهدى لمن استهدى أدلاء وقدر كل مرئ ما كان يحسره. The virtue of everybody is what he can perfect. And that's the real virtue. So the first reason why you're learning is that you want to be a person who knows. you, Because you know, no virtue is for you if you don't know. Okay. The second reason, the first reason you're learning is that you don't want to be ignorant, you don't want to be in the darknesses, you don't want to be upon misguidance. The second one is, you want to benefit the people. Right. And the third one is to revive the knowledge. To revive the knowledge that has been abandoned. And there's some sciences that you don't tend to find people talking about it. They just abandoned it. And the fourth reason you're learning it is to act upon the knowledge that you learned. You want to live by it. You want it to, to, to make it halal is halal and what is haram haram for you. Um, if you come with those two, you understand the value of knowledge and also you have that intention. It's a same intention. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, Yanalul mar'u, a person will attain knowledge biqadri niyati in accordance to his intention. And then after that, if you find the right person to teach you, a scholar, a grounded person of knowledge, and you benefit from that person, you're going to learn. And don't give up. A lot of people give up after a year or two. And do you think in these great scholars of Islam became ulama overnight? Of course not. The poet he said, He said, Go and seek knowledge. Don't give up on what you're trying to seek. The greatest harm for a student of knowledge is what? Is to give up. It's the greatest harm. أما ترى الماء بتكراره Do you not see the water when it keeps dropping on a rock? The water keeps it pierces the rock finally, and that's how it is. It's consistency. It's like consistency. Just keep going on. Don't give up. Why are you stopping for? So carry on. Yani, you will get somewhere. And sometimes when you're reading a book of a great scholar, you read a great scholar his book. You say you're shocked. You're you're taken back. Recently, um. I was listening to a voice note of Sheikh Abdullah Gale. He's a noble scholar from Somalia. In there, he mentions uh, yeah, 1972. When? 1972, which is a while back. Yeah. He was studying Al Fiat al Iraqi, Al Fiat al 1972. I loved it. It was 50 years ago, Taliban. Yeah. Of 50, uh, 40, yeah, 40 years ago. Yeah, 30, 50 years ago. 50 years ago. I mean, shocking, I mean, the, the, that time, the, the, what they were re reading, what they were benefiting from. Now, we, we uh, someone from us reads it and learns it. Or, I mean, or a person taught us these works, but we learn something later. We feel like we're better than the people mm. that we benefited from and the people. And it's ajeeb, a lie. Take me back. Yeah, I mean, that's double my age, nearly mm -hmm. double my life. Um, and we also have to remember the people who are teaching us and benefiting us when it comes to Islamic knowledge that we respect and we love them. Yeah, I mean, some of these mashayikh who die, people might disrespect them and look down at them. But they learned Salafiyyah and they learned Aqidat Ahl Sunnah because of these scholars. Mm -hmm. The poet he said, إذا أفادك إنسان بفائدة من العلوم فأدمن شكره أبدا وقل فلان جزاه الله صالحة أفادنيها وألقي الكبر والحسد If a person benefits you one hadith say to him جزاك الله May Allah reward you with good You benefited me this thing I didn't know before in my life And get rid of arrogance and stubbornness and this feeling that you have And a person taught you he took you out of the darkness of ignorance. He benefited you in your life personally. It outweighs anything that you might have against him. And then now you have the alim and the scholar. 
you you criticize him. You say he's not an Ahli Sunnah. He's Dalun, Mudillun. And he, your mom and dad were married when he was, you know, teaching and educating the Ummah. So how do you think you're going to learn if you disrespect the ulama? How are you going to learn? Mm -hmm. I, I, re I remember reading a while back, there were three men, Thumamata ibn Ashram, I think his name is, and Ibn Du'adin, and a third one. This was a long time ago when I read it. They were the reason why Ahmed ibn Hanbal was imprisoned and harmed and whatnot. And because of them, Ahmed ibn Nasr al-Khuzari was killed. So, I think it was Al-Wathiq who killed Ahmed ibn Nasr al-Khuzari. It was Al-Wathiq. I think it was Al-Wathiq. Al-Wathiq, after he killed Ahmed ibn Nasr al-Khuzari, he said, after he killed him a while went by, Ahmed ibn Nasr al-Khuzari became very hurt by what he did. He regretted it. Who's regretting it? Al-Wathiq, the Muslim leader. Right. He regretted killing Ahmed ibn Nasr al-Khuzari. So mm -hmm. he went to Ibn Du'ad and Thumama and he said, look, you guys are criminals. You guys are wrong. What you told me to do was something wrong. So three of them made dua against themselves. They said, yani, uh, Ibn Du'ad and he said, if I'm lying by Allah wa Taala, yani, kill me in my own skin. Thumama said, if I am lying and Ahmed Nasr al-Khuzari's death wasn't right, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me yani, swords of the people to slice me through. Yani, and the third one, I don't remember who he okay. was. All three of them died in the way they existed. Um, Ibn Du'adin, he died in his own skin. What does that mean? He, was, he couldn't talk. He was dead even before. He could just look at things. Uh, what's his name? Thumama died. Uh, he went to Umrah or Hajj, I think, and then the the tribe of Bani uh, Khuza'ah, the people of Ahmad Nasr al-Khuza'ah, saw him there and they said, oh, this is the guy who commanded our land. And they all took their blades and their swords and killed him. And then they took his body out of the haram. And they threw his body outside the outskirts of the city and, said, and they left him in the, in the middle of the plain, in the road. So the poet, he said, Ali ibn Asakir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, لُحُومُ الْعُلَمَاءِ مَسْمُومَةِ وعادة الله في هك أستار منتقصيه معلومة فمن أطلق لسانه بالعلماء بالثلب أبلاه الله قبل موته بموت القلب The flesh and the skin, يعني the honor of the scholars is very protected. And the norms of Allah سبحانه وتعالى is that the person who opens his tongue to the scholars to sow them, to speak bad about them, Allah will take your life your heart away from you, apostasy, innovation, deviation will happen to you before actual death comes to you. Wallahi, I saw people open their tongue on the ulama. I, mean, I remember a brother who one day insulted Sheikh Abdul Rizak al-Badr in front of me. And I said, this statement of yours, Wallahi, it's gonna, don't take it light. We just said right now, yeah. it's got a consequence to it. Humul ulama in masmuma. This is a guide. Remember this. The flesh of the scholars is poisonous. And he remembered this is going to go somewhere. Wallahi wa rabbil ka'ba, the brother, he, and he, had, yani, I don't know if he's a Muslim now, but that's all I can say. I don't know if he's a Muslim. If so, I just want to say, uh, it's to protect your akhirah. You don't want the scholar to be a khasm yawm al qiyamah. A person you feel umat al farid when you were a baby, you learnt the alif and ba and the ta and the ta, the differences between the ta and the ta. You learnt it from him. He taught you Salafiyyah. You learnt it from him. This alim, inshallah, you have to keep him in mind. But maybe Allah has hikam and wisdom in everything he says or does. Mm. Inshallah, maybe this is, this is the way Allah to expiate for the great Imam. That people speak about him and he gets their reward. Yawm al Qiyamah. And he gets rewarded for it. Yawm al Qiyamah. Mm. Um, I do want to say one thing that the scholars, yani Allah wa ta'ala mentions, for the scholars that they are I mean the famous hadith من سالك طريقا يلتمس في إما سهل الله له طريقا إلى الجنة وإن العلماء وإن العالم لا يستغفر له من في الأرض ومن في السماء حتى الحيتان في جوف الماء the Prophet mentioned in this hadith he said صلى الله عليه وسلم that the scholar the alim not only are the creations above, which is the, yani, the angels and the noble creations out there, 
but also the creation on this earth. Ask Allah's forgiveness for the ulama and the people of knowledge. They're making dua to Allah for it. Even the fishes in the sea. Because the earth gets destroyed when the scholars go. What do you mean by that? The absence of the scholars, when the scholars pass away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brings destruction to the earth. It's, a, or it's, a, it's, it's the earth losing, the destruction of the earth happening. And Allah ta'ala, he says, do you not see that we are reducing from the earth? Scholars of tafsir, and they differ amongst themselves. Abdullah ibn Abbas, for example, he says, Do you not see that we're reducing from the earth? Abdullah ibn Abbas, and he said, The destruction coming to the earth is by the scholars passing away. And the people of virtue. Mujahid ibn Jabrin, he said, Hassan al-Basri, he said, the death of a scholar, sorry. The death of a scholar is a thulma. It's a thulma. It's a vacuum. No one is able to ever fill that place as long as the day and the night alternate. And Imam Sa'id ibn Jubayrid, he uh, was mentioned Abu uh, Ala. Uh, Hilal ibn, I think Hilal ibn Khabbab, he said, Abu Ala, he said, I said to Sa'id ibn Jubayr, Ya Aba Abdullahi, ma alama tu halaki al ard? What is the sign that this earth is going to be destroyed? And then he said, Ida halaka ulama'uhu. If the scholars pass away and the scholars die, then know that the earth is being destroyed. The poet he said, Al ardu tahya ila ma asha alimuha, meta yamut alimu minha yamut tarafu, kal ardu tahya ila mal gaitu halla biha, wa in aba adafi aknafi ha telefu. And he took it from the ayah that the earth, if a scholar dies from the earth and passes away, is everything, uh, the khayr going. The angels are making dua for this creation of Allah. The people on the earth are benefiting and making dua for him. Even the creatures around him. It's because of him Allah is protecting the people to fall into sins. SubhanAllah, the scholars, historically, even when you look at them, they played a big role in Islam. What happened with SubhanAllah is that I was reading the seerah of Al-Izm al Salam, Rahimahullah. Izm al Salam, at his time, the ulama, they changed things. They changed issues. In the community, they play a, a direct change in the society. The leader of that time, uh, he came to uh, Al-Izz ibn Abdi Salam and he said to him, you can see the uh, Tatar are coming and waging war on Dar al-Misriya, Egypt. Um, what do you think we should do? And uh, he said to him, the money from the Bayt al-Mal al is coming to an end. We, can't, we don't have enough money. We're financially struggling. And he said to him, I would want to go to the businessmen, okay? Yeah. And I would also want to go to the uh, the Muslims and yeah, I place on them tax so I can get that money in order to fight, this is to save them and save the land. And Al-Izm Abdi Salam, rahimahullah, he said, there's nothing wrong with you taking money from the businessmen and the rich men. And there's also not a problem with you taxing the people in order to get that money to protect the land of the Muslims. But first of all, start with yourself, the money and the palaces and the qusur that you're living in and your employees and the people who work for you and the ministers and start with them first. Collect the money from them. <coughs> Once you have their money, I promise you the people will be easy to convince to give money. You see them take. And it was mentioned, then they went to the jihad with Yani and they won. So you say if you're doing and he, they went and they went to the jihad and they beat the Tatar. This was Ainu Jalut. Also, subhanAllah, he had another mawqif like that. Another sorry, role he played like that. What happened at this time was it was a day of Eid, the leader was coming out and um, the uh, people were going to the leader of course when they when he comes they crowded him they're touching him they're jumping on him and everything and the sheikh came walking to the leader and then he said to him 
uh, here you are enjoying the blessings of Dar al Misriya, the land, and you're enjoying everything, and you're reaping the benefits of this land. If Allah says to you, Al Qiyamah, Alam ubawi laka Misra, did I not give you Egypt and its treasures and everything? And here you are يعني, in control of this country, and there's a place, a shop that sells khamar. Mm. And then he said to him, is that really the case? Is there a place where Hamad is being sold? He said, yes. He said, where? The leader said. And then he said, shop so-and-so, they sell Hamad there. He said, but this, is, this was done way before me. My father is the one who uh, and was at that time, it's nothing me, I never did this. And then he said, you are gonna, you're from the people who are going to say, Inna we didn't have a, a, we, I thought we found we forefathers, we found our forefathers. We found our forefathers, we found our forefathers upon this way, and we're just going to tread on their path. The leader said, "Okay, wait." He commanded the, the uh, his employees or the workers to go and lock that place down, close it down. So the ulama had mawaqif bayda, and noble situations. Even recently in my country, Somalia. There was a uh, uh, an article that was written in the constitution in the country. Okay. There was an article written in the constitution of the country, and Subhanallah, the mashayikh came together. It was an article which was dangerous, which was khatir, which was kufriya, and they played their role. Ajeebullah. They came together. They wrote a bayan on it. They, I mean. And then they went to the they went to the the uh, leader of the country, mm. and they presented the situation to him and they said, "Is this something you're going to be pleased with?" Because remember, when a government who's officially recognizes is recognized, puts an article into the constitution to remove that is not going to be accepted internationally, and you can be held accountable sure. for that article yeah. because. Yeah. It can only be done by another. It's going to be a problem to remove it. Moving laws is not just jump and it goes through a hard procedure. The point is, it, it, the scholars are the ones who are going to do that. And they call the people to the They call the people to the good and they protect them from harm. Mm -hmm. So when these people go, you find people insulting up. Yani the Sahaba is coming out. You see people insulting yani the, the Masadir of Islam, Bukhari, and Muslim. Yani Yani corrupted innovators could, like as evil as this, can live at a time when knowledge goes down. The ones that we're seeing today. They can't. These, these innovators will never last a day at the time of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and the yeah. likes of these people. I've often heard you talk about the, the parable of the scholars being like the border control at the, at the country's borders. If you want to go into that a little bit more detail, I think that might be a benefit in that. Yani, an example for that is when Abdi Karim al awjad for example, he came and he said that uh, after they wanted to execute him, he said 4,000 hadiths maybe. He says, I made halal what was haram and I made haram what was halal. He made up hadiths basically. Yeah, made up hadiths, fabricated them, played around with your legislation. Yeah. Uh, so he, he said, you can kill me if you want to now. And uh, he was a heretic. And subhanAllah, the Muslim leader said to him, don't worry. You're going to die. Your, your life has come to an end now. As for what you've done and you left behind, the great scholars of Islam are going to live for this. The likes of Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, Ashaq al-Fizari, Malik ibn Anas, ibn Juraj, and Rawza'i, and later Musa, these great Imams of Islam, are going to come and they're going to stand over it and they're going to look deep into it and they're going to sift through it. And there isn't a hadith out there except that it's been looked at. It's been sifted through, it's been checked, it's been verified, it's been looked at. Whether there are difference of opinion on it, but there's, every narration has been looked at, it's been and scrutinized, whether the Prophet said it or not. That's what the scholars are. They protect our religion for us. They, they are a means for us to worship Allah ala basira. 
So their death, of course, is pain, it's suffering. It's, it's actual pain, you feel it. And uh, the Prophet وسلم, he said in a hadith, hadith Anas ibn Malik, the Prophet وسلم, he said, لا يأتي زمان إلا والذي بعده شر منه سمعت من نبيكم Anas ibn Malik, he said this. He said, there won't come a time except the one after it is going to be worse. Mm. And it is, as, as time goes on, it's going to get worse. Scholars then question, as Ibn Hajar mentions in Fatih al-Bari, that this hadith, يعني قد اشتشكل هذا الاطلاق, this unrestricted statement of لا يأتي زمان إلا والذي بعده شر منه. How do we work on this hadith that there's not a time except the time after it is worse? When Hajjad ibn Yusuf was before Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Right, yeah, yeah. And Umar Abdul Aziz is a noble man who, you know, his time, Ibn Hajar even says, you could even say that the evil was gone. You know, that's how well, you know, shal was, happiness, joy was for the Muslims. So how do you reconcile that with the hadith? And subhanAllah, Ibn Hajar says, many people have said different views, he brings their all their views, then he brings a view from Abdullah al Muslim. How to reconcile between us. He mentions that even that though, the, I mean, the time of Hajjad ibn Yusuf, the killing of the people was more, the Sahabas were, 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 were there, the, I mean, the Tabi'in were killed, like Sayyidina Jubail and others were killed. Lakin, it means the ulama were more at the time of who? Hajjad ibn Yusuf. Mm. And there were less ulama at the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So whose time was literally better when we look at it? So the issue isn't about rain coming down, Abdul Aziz would say, it's not about crops, it's not about the vegetations, it's based on who was alive at that time. The Prophet ﷺ, he told us in a hadith, سَيَأْتِيَ عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِهِ زَمَانٌ There's going to come a time to my ummah, and it signs of the hour. The Prophet said, يَقْثُلُ الْقُرَّاءُ The reciters are going to be a lot. وَيَقِلُّ الْفُقَهَا And the jurists will be very little. وَيُقْبَضُ الْعِلْمُ وَيَقْثُرُ الْجَهْرِ وَيَقْثُرُ الْحَرَجِ Knowledge will be removed and death will become a lot. Subhanallah. This time when it comes, the hadith mentions, the reciters are more. The people are and people are going to recite, recite, recite. Readers, people read them. And it is not fiqh, comprehend, there's no understanding of what you're reading. وَيُقْبَضُ الْعِلْمُ the people of knowledge will be taken. Mm. Right after that, it says, وَيَقْثُرُ الْحَرْجُ وَيَقْثُرُ الْحَرْجُ means what? Death will become a lot. The murdering, the killing will be a lot. Mm. Here, it's saying that when scholars die, people will be unjustly killed. Right, I see. It's a connection between the two. It's a connection. One person. In another wording, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ مِنْ أَشَرَاتِ السَّاعَةِ From the signs of the hour is, أَنْ يَدْهَبَ الْعِلْمُ Knowledge will go. وَيَظْهَرُ الْجَهْلُ and ignorance will become what? More. وَيُشْرَبُ الْخَمْرُ Alcohol will be consumed. وَيَفْشُ zina. The zina will spread. وَيَقِلُّ الرِّجَالُ the, man, the men will become little. وَتُكْثَرُ النِّسَاءُ The women will be made a lot. حَتَّى يَكُونُ قَيِّمُ خَمْسِينَ مَرَأَةٍ رَجُلٌ وَاحِدٌ Then a man will be 50. Mm-hmm. One man to 50 women. Some of the scholars, they explain this hadith to me. First of all, look at it. Ignorant knowledge will be taken. Ignorance will spread. Right after that, what's going to happen? People are going to start consuming alcohol. People are going to fall into zina. Because the people who used to stop the people from this are now going. They're dying, they're passing away. These two right now have been made halal by the people I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And zina, it's become become normal for the people. Why do you care what this brother is drinking? Mm -hmm. Defa, defense will come. No. Yeah. So we've obviously spoken a lot about the scholars and how important they are in our religion. What exactly is a scholar? What makes a scholar? Can we go into a bit more detail? So the scholars, yeah, I mean, of Islam, there are scholars in worldly knowledge. But when we say scholar, we're referring to a person who is grounded. Uh, in the religion of Islam. There are characteristics that the scholars have in order to know who a scholar is and who's not a scholar. The first one is عِنْدَهُ رِسَالَةُ الْمُحَمَّدِيَ The person who's a scholar, he has, he's inherited 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So in other words, he knows a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Of course, the Quran is a must. Yeah. He has that hadith. Person who doesn't have hadith, and all day he's got Imam so and so said this, and Imam so and so. He's just got the views of many scholars. It doesn't make him a scholar. And if you know Malik said this, and Ozai said this, and later Rusaid said, doesn't necessarily make you a scholar. First of all, you have to have the delete, the Nusus al Wahyid. But in that case, the hadith what is mentioned, in the ulama, what is the ulama, what is the ulama, what is the ulama, what is So, what you've, her- you've inherited the Prophet's statements? Yes. Okay. That's the first one. So, by itself is not enough. Okay. That's the first thing. Second is, Ma'arifa to wujuh al Khiraat. No Khiraat. Person knows the different stages of the Quran. Abu Darda, Ahmad narrated it with Sanadi, with his own chain of narration. Ahmad narrated that Inna kala tafqahu kull al fiqh. You're not going to truly understand. Hatta tara lil Qurani wujuha. Until when you look at the Quran, you're not going to be a fakih. You're not going to be understanding of this religion, unless when you read the Quran, you can see different recitations and the meanings that are in each recitation. Is Haq ibn Abi Tamim at Sakhtiani? He commented on the statement of Abu Darda. He said, "Yahab al Iqdami Ali." The person becomes very vigilant to go forward and speak about the Quran because you need to know Qur'an and stuff like that. The third one is Ma'rifa to Aqwal al-Sahaba, and then Ali knows the statements of the Sahabas. Um, Sa'id ibn Abi Aruba he said, "Man lam yasma' ilil ikhtilaf fa la ta'udhu fa alima." The one who hasn't heard the different views of the Sahabas, don't consider him a scholar. فَلَتْ عُدُّهُ عَالِمًا Malik rahimahullah was asked uh, I mean he used to say with his statement he used to say لَا تَجُوزُ فُتْيَا إِلَّا لِمَنْ عَلِمَ مَخْتَلَفَ النَّاسُ فِيهِ He used to say that and Imam Malik used to say it is not permissible for a person an individual إِلَّا لِمَنْ عَلِمَ مَخْتَلَفَ النَّاسُ until he knows what the people differ upon mm-hmm. so then they said to him اختلاف أهل الرأي are you talking about the اختلاف of the people of رأي يعني اختلاف أهل الرأي is the اختلاف of the people of العراق he referring to that, he said, لا اختلاف أصحاب محمد. I'm referring to the اختلاف of the Sahabas of the Prophet And then he said, وعلم الناسق والمنسوق The abrogated verses and the ones that abrogated. من القرآن from the Quran. ومن حديث رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. The person knows the hadith of the Prophet. ولذلك تهجدين السبك, he write this point. He says, إن المرأة إذا لم يعرف علم الخلاف والمأخذ لا يكون فقيها إلى أن يلج الجمل في سم الخيام. That a person is not considered a person of knowledge. He's not. If he doesn't know the differences of opinions amongst the Sahabas, you know Ibn Abbas said Ibn Mas'ud, and you know the Aqwal of the Sahabas. And you do, not only do you not just know what the difference of opinion, you know what the root reason for the differences is. If you don't know that, Tajuddin al Suqi said, You're never an Alim, Hatta Yali Jal Jabal Fi Sam al Until the camel goes through the needle. Also, uh, Abdul Malik ibn Habib and he said سمعت ibn Majishun I heard ibn Majishun in saying كانوا يقولون the people used to say يعني the ulama used to say Malik and other great scholars used to say لا يكون إمام في الفقه a person is not an imam in fiqh يعني understanding من لم يكن إمام في القرآن والآثار if you don't know the Quran and the Sunnah Abdullah ibn Barak and he said uh, I mean, he was asked Abdullah ibn Barak uh, when is it permissible for a man and yuftiya to give fatwa? When can a man come forward and give fatwa from himself? He said, If this person has knowledge of the athar, and the sunnah of the Prophet and the sahabas, basiran bil ra'i, and he has insight of ra'i, yani fiqh. So he's, he's got the yani Quran and the sunnah, and he's got the ability to extract the evidences for, from it. Also, a person who is a scholar is a person who doesn't follow the strange He doesn't follow the strange opinions. And we find people today, all they do is, oh, this person, what did he say? Oh, he said it's halal. Oh, jazakallah khair. What about Hazrat? Ulama don't do that. But in that case, Abdul Mahdi, he said, لا يكون إمام في العلم من أخذ بالشاد من العلم. He's not an imam in knowledge, the one who takes strange opinions. Also, the fifth quality of a scholar is. He's, what he gets right is more than what he does wrong. Okay. We don't believe the scholars are infallible. We believe they do mistakes, they come with shortcomings. But what they do right is more than what they do wrong. وَلِذَلِكَ حَافِظُ بْنَ عَبْدِ الْبَرْ رَحِمَ اللَّهِ in his kitab Jamal Bayan al-Ilm wa Sadri he says لَا يَسْلَمُ الْعَالَمُ مِنَ الْخَطَيِ An alim is never safe from mistakes. And he's not free from doing mistakes. فَمَنْ أَخْطَعَ قَلِيلًا Anyone who does 
and little bit mistakes, he does few mistakes. وَأَصَابَ كَثِيرَ and he gets it right a lot. Then فَوَ الْعَالِمُ he's a scholar. وَمَنْ أَصَابَ قَلِيلًا anyone who gets it right, but sometimes here and there. وَأَخْطَأَ كَثِيرًا and he does many mistakes. فَوَ الْجَاهِلُ he's ignorant. He's ignorant. A sign of an alim, to know this person is an alim, is that عنده, with him is قدرة, the ability على الدفاع الشريعة, he can defend the religion. We know a hadith of Imam Khatib al-Baghdadi who narrated in his kitab Sharaf al-Sahib al-Hadith Ibn Abdi al also narrated in his kitab al-Tabid that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and inshallah ta'ala is sahih يحمل هذا العلم this knowledge will be carried by من كل خلف every generation is going to take from him عدوله the trustworthy ones are going to really take on it ينفون عنه تحريف الغالين وانتحال المغطلين وتأويل الجاهلين what they defend from this religion is what? The distortion of the extreme one. And also the ignorant of the ignorant one, what he's saying about the religion, and speaking with no understanding and comprehension. And the distortion he wants to do the interpretive, he can't defend the religion. Someone who can't do it and who can't defend the religion. Whenever Shu has brought him, he goes, Akhi Wallahi, I don't know. I'm confused. Wallahi doubts it seeped into my heart. You know, I was in a state of confusion for the last 30 years or the last five years, you know. That's not an alim. An alim can defend his religion. Yeah. Okay? He doesn't crumble his own, his whole entire religion. I mean, today, if you go to a gathering and they talk about God doesn't exist and you come out and say, Allah, my head's hurting me. Why? Can you doubt Allah? That means you are not, not, you don't have knowledge of the religion. In Islam, we have, after the Prophet died, we have people known as Fuqaha is Sab'ah in Medina. These are the people who were the fuqaha of Medina, seven men. The poet, he said, إِذَا قِيلَ مَنْ فِي الْسَبْعَةُ إِذَا قِيلَ مَنْ فِي الْعِلْمِ سَبْعَةُ أَبْحُرٍ رِوَايَتُهُمْ لَيْسَتْ عَلَيْ الْعِلْمِ خَارِجَ فَقُلْهُمْ عُوَيْدُ اللَّهِ عُرْوَةٌ قَاسِمٌ سَعِيدٌ أَبِي بَكْرٍ سُلَيْمَانُ خَارِجَ Seven. These seven are called fuqaha al-sab'ah. These seven men, رحمهم الله, they defended the religion. يعني they understand, they transmitted, they gave the meaning. The sixth quality of a scholar is his students, that he produces, the kind of students he has. Al-Imam uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he, he has appraisal on the Kitab al-Radd al-Wafir of uh, Nasruddin al-Dimashqi. Nasruddin al-Dimashqi wrote a Kitab where he wanted to praise Ibn Taymiyyah. A man came out and he said, anyone who calls Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam is a kafir. So Nasruddin al-Dimashqi came and he authored a book. And in this book, Nasruddin al-Dimashqi, brings the statement of great scholars who said Ibn Taymiyyah and Shaykh al-Islam, referred to him as Shaykh al-Islam. And they said, are you going to make a fear of these people? Mm. Ibn Hajar read this book of Nasir al-Din al-Dimashqi. And he then put appraisal on the book. He put it, you can find it, it written by his Shams al-Din al brings it in his kitab, Al-Jawahir al-Dura. Ibn Hajar, he says about Ibn Taymiyyah, after he praises him, he says, وَلَوْ لَمْ يَكُلْ لِلشَّيْخِ تَقِيِّ الدِّينَ وَلَوْ لَمْ يَكُلْ لِلشَّيْخِ تَقِيُّ الدِّينَ If there was nothing for Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, من المناقب had no other virtue إلا تلميده الشهير Except he's what? He's well-known student. الشيخ شمس الدين ibn القيب الجوزية صاحب التسانيف النافعة The one who wrote many beneficial books. السائرة التي انتفع بها الموافق والمخالف The one who agrees with ibn Taymiyyah and ibn القيب would be, can say, you know what, I did not benefit him. And the ones who oppose them, of course, is going to, or the one who opposes them agrees that he, there is benefit in these works of Ibn al right. And the one who agrees with Ibn al would admit there is benefit yeah. in it. That man alone, Ibn al-Qayyim, that Ibn Taymiyyah produced, لَكَانَ غَايَةُ فِي الدَّلَالَةِ عَلَىٰ عَظِيمِ بِمَنْزِلَةِ It's enough to show you the status of Ibn Taymiyyah. Right. Also, another Eighth quality is Qatratul Mu'allafat al nafiah The person has great books, written in a lot of books. Abu Tahir al Silafi, when he spoke about Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi, the author of the Kitab, called Al Uzla and whatnot. Abu Tahir al Silafi says about Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi to show you that this man is an alim and how deeply grounded he is in knowledge. Look at his works. So, for example, at our era now, you have Muhammad Nasr al-Din al-Albani. Mm -hmm. Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, look at his works. 
if you put away everything else aside, just look at his works, that is enough for you to say he's a alim. Even if you put aside all the scholars, what do they say about him? If you try to deny the works of Shaykh al Islam, Shaykh Muhammad Nasruddin al Rabbani, it's like you put your hand on the, the sun. <laughs> it doesn't make the root, it's just the earth dark. No, it doesn't. That's still bright. Mm. You're just blinding yourself from the reality of something. Yeah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he bendi wa karami, that he doesn't take these great scholars away from us and then leave us in darknesses. Mm. Well, like one of the things I really fear, Shahid, is that when these scholars die, and it's, it's what's happened historically in Islam, and it's fear, and we ask Allah sincerity for, for it. And that's why I want to take this opportunity to say to the listeners, the people who are watching, those are the ulama. Those are the qualities that they have. Don't give this title to Shaykh, Alim, Scholar, to a baby student of knowledge. Yeah. Because you're playing with terms of the Sharia. And what generally happens is that when the scholars die, what happens is a concept known as Tar'isul Jahala. The ignorant people are pushed forward. Either they push themselves forward or a, people in his circle say, you know, they push him forward. And he somehow believes from that that he's Shaykh al-Islam of his time and it confuses him. And he tried to confuse the other people. I did mention the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As uh, in Sahihayn, Inna Allah la yakhbir al-ilm al-tiza'a. Al-Imam al-Tartushi rahimahullah, when he explained this hadith, he brought something very powerful out of it. He says, فَتَدَبَّرْ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ He says, ponder and contemplate on this hadith. He says, this hadith shows it's powerful, فَائِدَ لَطِيفَ He brought out of it. He says, this hadith shows that the harm does not come to the people from their ulama. The issue, the problems that people have in the religion, the confusion, is, it doesn't come from the ulama. And issues that they have in their worldly affairs, and why they can't reconcile, the text is not making, but what's happening here, it doesn't come from the ulama. Mm. It comes from, إِنَّمَا يُؤْتَوْنَ He says, مِنْ قِبَلِ أَنَّهُ it comes to them from the angle of they go to the, the ignorant people, people they think are scholars. And when they go to those people, they ask those people for questions, and those people bring back, bring forward some shocking things to the table, and yeah. Yeah. problems come from there. So here I'm scared that this might be a situation that might happen. So it is advice I give to the brothers and sisters who. Uh, I speak to and those who inshallah ta'ala don't get the chance to speak to them to understand that the ulama are those people we're mentioning with those qualities. Shatibi mentions and Ya'taqi, he mentions something very powerful. He says, Ay Ya'taqi dal insanu fi nafsi, O Yu'taqa de fihi and no mi ahli the ilmi, while it's the hadi fi dini, while I'm yablu tilka dara jati ala dalik, where you add dura you write in wahilafu hilafa, he says. He says, I'm a fayumalu ala dalik, where you add dura you write in. It's one of the problems that we're going to see. What are the asbab al furqat al ikhtilaf, differences of opinions, why we see division amongst the Muslims. One of the reasons Shah Tibi points out is a person sees in himself that he's a scholar. Mm. Or those around him, his circles look crude, they see him as a scholar. And they start to take his view as a view out there. Right? And then they say, ikhtalaf al ulama. The scholars have differed in this issue. Um, are the scholars really different in this issue? No. The scholars haven't different in this issue. There's a jahil and a scholar. The jahil, of course, is not given any consideration. And the scholars are given consideration. And remember, Dehbi said something very powerful. He said, A people who attributed themselves to knowledge from the outer. So from the outer, they look like scholars. They dress like the scholar. They wear the bisht and the shimar and they wear the imam and like, you know, all of this. And then he says, And they didn't crowd They only know little things about it. Which then they start to think that they're scholars. Yeah. So those are the scholars. They are passing away every day. There are senior scholars now still alive, like Al Allama, Al Sheikh Salah Al Fawzan, Al Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al Abad. Uh, Sheikh Rabi'i ibn Hadi al-Madkhali and other great scholars who are still alive fi qaid al hayat we should go to those scholars and benefit from them and you know see them as 
that is there, they are, they are those last moments of their lives and be connected to them because whilst we are with our ulama and we're stuck with the ulama and we're connected with the ulama, inshallah we have khair. If we leave the ulama and we abandon the scholars, we will suffer. Yeah. It's not, it's not a low status to, to call somebody a scholar. It's not a light term. It's not an easy thing to achieve. It shouldn't be thrown around um, easily like that. And I think um, in our time, certainly, there's two ways really that I see this issue of the, the ignorant people pushing themselves forward in, uh, instead of the scholars. One of them is through the death of the scholars, which we've been talking about. But another one is actually become very regional. Like there are no scholars in the West, for example, you hear these statements and therefore I need to come forward and I need to give a tower in the West because I understand the reality of the West better than the scholars in the East do. And I think you mentioned this previously on the podcast and I really like your approach and this is a very balanced approach. How should we deal with this situation where admittedly there are people in the West who know the situation, the reality better than the scholars in the East, yet they don't have the knowledge that the scholars of the East do. How do we reconcile between the two? It's, it's straightforward. If, if you know a situation, we do that on a regular basis. Even my, my relationship with my employees or the people I work with, or my relationship with my spouse, for example, I know it. And when I go to the scholar, I don't give myself a to it because I know those situations. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the same situation. You have a problem with your wife. You don't go, I know my situation about me and my wife, so I'm just going to give the fatwa. Mm -hmm. You take the situation to an alim. So you sit in front of the scholar and you say, Sheikh, I'm married, I've got a wife. This is what she's saying. This is what I'm saying. There's a difference in this khilaf amongst us. What does Allah and his messenger say in this situation? What's the delil? What's the issue? Help me out, Sheikh. What's the best way to go about it? And so that's just a very... Uh, yeah. It seems very obvious when you lay it out like yeah. that. So there's the role of the student of knowledge in the West is to present the situation to the scholar uh -huh. in the East, for example, and then get the fatwa. But not to say that the scholar doesn't understand and then I'm just going to present the fatwa. Yeah, and basically. if the scholar is in the West, then Alhamdulillah, yeah. you go to him. If he is in the West, and you have a scholar in the West, Alhamdulillah, you go to that scholar and you ask him, but the thing is that we're finding, and it, tr truth be said, we're finding people who are truly not, and they don't have knowledge of the deen. Mm. They don't have knowledge. Everyone can see that. Any baby, yeah, any beginner student of knowledge can see that. That this person doesn't have knowledge. And he's, he's trying to debunk big concepts in Islam. I recently read a book on the misconceptions that he's thrown against Islam. One author, I don't want to mention his name. He wrote a book. And he's trying to speak on some hadiths and try, because the liberal Western academia are pushing these shubhas against Islam. So he took it upon himself to respond to these yeah, misconceptions against Islam. And he goes into authentication and weakening. And hadith. Like, what do you know about hadith? What's your quality? And it, I don't remember when I mentioned those conditions. Yeah. Certificate is irrelevant if you don't have the knowledge. If you have the certificate with the knowledge, Allah Mabarik, you've got ni'ma upon ni'ma. Yeah. So when I say qualification, I don't mean a certificate given to you by an institution or a certificate given to you by a center. So what do you know about the science? You know yourself. You're going to stand in front of Allah, Yawm al -Qiyama. What do you know about this issue? And the beauty about a person is Rahim Allah May Allah have mercy upon a person To know yourself is not bad And say I don't know these issues Hakikat I don't And the benefit with that is Shahid Once you do say I don't know it It's one of the things that opens seeking knowledge Even for you You go on and seek more knowledge Because you know you don't know But when you lie to yourself and say I do know You never learn That person five years later when you come to him He still doesn't know anything like when you admit and you say, I don't know this, صراحت, I really don't know it. And if you say, I follow Imam Abu Hanif, Shafi, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmed, all of them said, Why do you only follow them in fiqh issues but not follow them in la'adri? Follow them in fiqh issues as well. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're truly suffering from that perspective. And it's sad because people are very fast in speaking about religious issues, but worldly issues that I, I, I don't know, I'm to be honest. Uh, recently I was with a brother 
And uh, I was asking about how to use the iPhone thing. So, so like, what do you do here? Okay. And it's a brother I know who speaks about everything regarding the religion. I always tell him, like, don't talk about issues of the religion. Then he calmed down and he's issue on Khabira Jinta. If you have an answer and you've researched the issue and you've looked into the answer of this question and you have your research and you've looked at al now yeah. you can speak about it. Rather, you're an alim in that question, like the answer that you have. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. But to just speak about everything and you know yourself that you don't know is ignorance. So, but when I asked him about the, uh, he goes, I don't know, man. I can't speak what I don't know. <laughs> I use that as a force. And I said, what about the deal of Allah? Because it hit me, just click. Yeah. click. Yes. I hope that becomes a, a wake up call for him and myself. But that's the thing. And Allah, when you look at the shuyukh and the ulama, and sometimes Allah, I call some shaykh and a Somali shuyukh, and even Arab scholars, I call them sometimes. I speak to them when I want to do things, like for example, the podcast, how I do it, what I say, or even a lecture I want to give, or a series I want to give. And uh, I've researched it. Mm. I've looked it up. I've looked at the aqwal of the ulama on this issue. And then I call an alim and I say, Sheikh, I've come across this mas'ala in this particular way. What do you think? Did I understand it properly? Also, is the issue, and is it like this? And I listen to what he has to say. Mm. I, I listen to his view. I look at what he says. He's got to take a side of the views I've seen. I have a niqash discussion with him. Well, I don't always do taqlid of the shaykh. If I don't agree with what the shaykh said, I don't take it necessarily. But at least I, 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 I benefit a lot from them. You benefit from them. Sometimes you've learned hikam. I remember uh, the kitab at Tibiyari fi Adabi Hamalatul Quran when I was teaching it. Yeah. Another thing I benefited from our shaykh is that there's a chapter where Nawawi speaks about the issue of the Mukhannat. Mm. The Mukhannat is a what? Uh, Hamaphrodite. Yeah, Hamaphrodite. Yeah, that's the word for it, correct. And Imam al Nawawi speaks about it. In our land, we don't have this issue, Somalia. So when the sheikh was teaching, he goes, we don't have this problem, so there's no need to talk about it. So he flipped the page over. That really resonated with me. Not everything you read, this is Tibiyan fi Adab Hamlet al Quran. It's a book you, it's not a raft. Not everything you see in a book, is, you go out and you tell everybody about it. Yeah. And this, Hadith al Nasa bi ma yarifuna turiduna ayu kadab Allah wa Rasuluh. لست بمحدث قوم حديثا لن تبلغ عقولهم إلا كان لبعض فتنة. As Ali and Ibrahim Musawwir both was narrated from them. They said, and he tell the people what their brains can comprehend. Do you want them to disbelieve in Allah and His Messenger, uh, or you don't tell the people that which their minds cannot comprehend, except that you become a fitna for them, cause the people fitna. And then the alim is not one just who knows. He knows when the time to speak is there, he speaks, and when he sees that this is not the time to speak, this is. Time to hold back. Then he holds back. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the people of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. They're the people Allah chosen on this earth. They are holding this religion, defending it, spreading it. The least that we can do is study their biographies. And these ulama that I'm mentioning, in our I mean, Sheikh Al-Bani when he died, and then Sheikh Al-Uthaymeen and Sheikh Al-Mubaz, all of these great scholars of Islam, are in the dunya, wallahi haqiqatan. We need to know who they are. Yeah. To benefit, like, so we can benefit from them. So we can benefit from their lives. So we can give them their rights. It's sad for a Muslim today to know how much a football player was bought for and who's better, this football player or this football player and what team he's on, yeah, I mean, or to know actors and actresses. Yeah, I mean, you have to, also if you're a student of baby student of knowledge, you don't know much about the religion. If you don't know, you know you don't know. Don't speak about the people of knowledge. A brother, if you're not in da'wah, you're just a Muslim nine to five, your opinion regarding a view or an issue or your opinion regarding a da'i or talib or ilm, or your opinion regarding a scholar is irrelevant. If you're not in da'wah, if you're just 
an employee, nine to five worker, you go, honey, just do your job. This is not your majan. I mean, you find brothers who are bus drivers. Mm. They are school teachers. And they're talking about who should be taught, took knowledge from, and this person is good and critiquing people. Ahi, ihida. Take care of your children, take care of your wife, take care of your family. Ahi, leave this field for its people. If you're a student of knowledge, stick to your. The, don't speak about ulama what they have against each other. Yeah, on that point, there are there are situations where there are genuine differences and disagreements between the scholars. How should our <laughs> attitude be when that occurs? Like we've got two scholars that we both love and respect, but they disagree with each other. Um, how should we navigate through that kind of issue? If these people do two ulama are ahl sunnah, both of them, how do we have to respect both alim? I mean, of course, a haq might be with, be with one, and the other one might be wrong. Like in, we, we look at Nawriyatul Khata, we look at the type of mistake that he did. I have to understand. If it's a mistake, I mean, first of all, the default position is that an alim is not ma'asum. My brothers, some brothers, they loosely use it. Mean, infallible. It's not infallible. Some brothers, they say there's a mulahaba on this person. I'm a, yeah. do you, who is, if, you've just proven to be this person as a human being that I mean, haven't brought. I mean, are you expecting him to be errorless? No faults, no, no errors? Who are you expecting to be perfect and have no mistakes and errors? Like in, you're telling me this brother's in doubt for the last 10, 15, 20 years and he's mashallah that four, four mistakes, mm-hmm. five mistakes that you have against him? Come on. And they're not in the usul. Like, the and they're not fundamental, the fundamental issues. Issue. Fundamental issue. And of course, one mistake can, can make a person leave the religion of Islam. Mm-hmm. And one mistake can also take you out of the sunnah. I'm not saying it's the quantity of mistakes, but that being said, that being said, it's, yani, you, you yourself, you know, you misconstrued the statement of that imam or that sheikh. You misconstrued it and you played around with it. And it's not necessarily the case. In a situation like that, akhi, taqillah, wallah, he's going to be your khasmi yawm al-qiyamah. You're going to stand in front of Allah, in front of Allah, and you're going to, he's going to ask you, you're going to give me his righteous deeds. So think about what you're saying. If, you want, if you're just trying to please your crew and your, and your, your party, then you can... Do it for now, inshallah. Mm. Like in when you stand in front of Allah, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and you've taken this person's honor, you said what you said about them, and they don't forgive, because they, they're dead, how can they forgive you? Um, think twice about what you say. It's mm. very true. And, and I think- so, coming back to the question, your answer, sorry, is that we've seen this historically take place in Islamic history. Mm. Ulama who've had, like Ibn Ishaq and Malik Ibn Anas, and they critiqued each other deeply, deeply, deeply. I and mean, it deeply. But what thing, what thing really takes me back, subhanAllah, and I, and I find it so different to our time compared to that time. The issue of scholars speaking against each other doesn't seem to be new. That I will. Okay. I've seen it. I don't know. It's wadah. It's wadah. That what the scholars say about one another seems to be consistent. I mean, Ibn Manda and Muhammad Nasr al-Marwazi, those two. You have Ibn Ishaq and you have uh, Malik ibn Anas. I mean, what's there? Bukhari and Yahya Duhali. And he's, you find that. Akran, Ibn Hajar, Ibn Dhabi, Sir Alam, and he says, Kalam al Akran, Yutwa, Wala Yurwa. And in the statements of the contemporaries, is dismissed and it's not narrated. It's just net mentioned and here it is, but not, we don't take Kalam al Akran. Uh, I think it was Ali ibn al Madini uh, in the Muqaddima of Al Jarhu al Ta'adil. The Tahqiq of Abdu'l-Hayy al Ali ibn al-Madini said, I don't take the nari- I don't take the criticism of Abu Nu'ayn Fadl al-Dukain and Affan ibn Muslim Safah. I don't take these two men. I don't take their criticism. Ali ibn al-Madini, hmm. Shaykh al-Imam al-Bukhari. Bukhari said, I never belittled myself in the presence of anyone wow. the way I belittled myself in the presence of Ali ibn al-Madini. Bukhari said this. Ali ibn al-Madini said, if a criticism comes to me from Abu Nu'ayn Fadl ibn Dukayn and Affan ibn Muslim Safah, those two men criticize a person. They're two great imams, by the way. Abu Nu'ayn Fadl ibn Dukayn is the man who, who kicked Yahya ibn Ma'in on the chest and the story of Ahmed ibn Ma'in. It's Shuyukh al-Bukhari, they're in the hadith books. Ali ibn Madinim get mentioned his reason why he doesn't want to take the criticism of who Abu Nu'ayn Fadl ibn Dukayn and Affan ibn Muslim. He said there's a reason why I don't want to take it. 
because they speak about everybody. They, criti they criticize everybody. I don't take the narration. You know what really shocked me? Abdul Hayy Harim Alimi even pointed it out, if my memory serves me right. He said that you will, you will struggle today to find the criticism of Abdul Rahim Fadl Midu Kayyim. And Afan al Muslim in the Kutub Jazarah Got dismissed. Got dismissed. So you find people critiquing one another, especially when two people are like, yani Akran. Things happen, personal issues might come. One might be jealous of the other sure. person. Honey, this is common. It's fine. It does happen. It's nothing new. What I don't see from the Salaf is the students going on one side and the other. Do we have that like Imam Muslim, for example, student of Imam Bukhari? Hmm. Do we have that situation between Bukhari and Duhli? Yes, Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala was honey, wrongly treated. Really serious. Bukhari left. He left the city. Went. And he, and you know, he didn't, he asked Allah to take his life. And Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, the man who today works, read his works. The Ahnaf gave Bukhari a hard time, rahimahullah ta'ala. Yani, Akhi, Abu al-Hajjaj al-Mizzi, the author of the kitab, Tahdeeb al-Kamal. Yeah. Tahdeeb al-Kamal, Abu al-Hajjaj al-Mizzi. Hajjaj al-Mizzi, Abu al-Hajjaj al-Mizzi, in the Jami'a Amr, Jami'a al-Umawi, Jami'a al-Umawi, I think it was, in Dimashq. He sat down to read the kitab Khalq wa Af'ali al-Ibadi. Khalq wa Af'ali al-Ibadi, sat down to read it. The Ash'ara of that time, they, they got angry with that. They went and they, they spoke to the leader to get rid of Abu al-Hajjaj al-Mizzi was taken, was put in prison. He was in prison. Who came in his defense? Sheikh Hussam Taymiyyah. Apparently that was the, the rare situation where Ibn Taymiyyah had a good relationship with the, with the, with the leaders and the governments. Mm. So he went, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and remember Ibn Taymiyyah, and uh, by the way, when I say Ibn Taymiyyah had a good relationship with the leaders, I don't mean he was a rebel that was going against them. Mm. What I mean by that is that every leader would generally put Ibn Taymiyyah in prison. Because of those Hawashi and the Bitana that were around him. Sure. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he went and, yani, the, he mentions, the story mentions, he went to the, yani, the gates, yani, the prison himself, Ibn Taymiyyah, and he unlocked. Fabul Hajj al Mizzi said, Come out. And he al Hajj al Mizzi, I brought him out, and he said, Man, like you should not be in prison. The point I'm trying to take from this is that historically, we find ulama being belittled, Salafi mashayikh, ulama ahl sunnah speaking against each other. Yani, qadiyya between Shaykh al Albani and the issue of Ibn Ubaz, but they had an issue of, yani, issues of salah, issues, qadaya umur, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Shaykh Hamoud ibn Abdullahi Tawijiri, this current time, I remember when I first read the works of Shaykh al Albani against Hamoud ibn Abdullahi Tawijiri, when I first read it, mm -hmm. I read the kitab Arad al Mufhim. I and my, my little brother and I, we, we were discussing this issue. And so what happened was, I got the kitab Arad al Mufhim of Al Imam uh, Al Bani, rahimahullah ta'ala, on the issue of Jilbab al Niqab. So what I did was, I would read it, and in my head, I'm like, this Hamud bin Abdullah Tawijir is a Mubtadi. The way Sheikh Nasr was speaking, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he was an innovator, yeah. and that he's not from Ahlul Sunnah, and he has not, that's not my belief. Until I went in and I found out Shaykh Hamoud Abdullah Tawijir was Imam in Ayyub Sunnah. Rahimahullah ta'ala. I even read in a kitab, Ma'alim fi tariq talab al-ilm by Shaykh Abdul Aziz Sadhan. What I read in it is that Shaykh Abdul Aziz Sadhan mentions that Shaykh Al Albani would land in Riyadh and he would, he would call, uh, what's his name? Uh, Al Shaykh Hamoud uh, Abdullah Tawijir. Imagine. Yeah. It wasn't personal for them. But if you read the works, it would seem that you know why you would believe there's no other explanation. Yeah, they, they argue on the issue of the record after the record when you get up. Sif Salat Nabi, critique Sif Salat Nabi Abdul Bari. Shaykh Abdul Bari called him Jail. Shaykh Abdul Bari called him. He called him, he called him a Mutasib Hambari. Can you actually had it while I had it? What you don't read, really, I mean, what you don't see is two things. The students of Sheikh Al Albani mm. did not part in his nah. Ismail Al Ansari, you see, Sheikh Ismail, Sheikh Mashur, you said this to me. Ismail Al Ansari and Sheikh Al Albani went back and forth on the issue of uh, the issue of Dhahab uh, Al Muhallaq. Back and forth. Sheikh Nas was very harsh. 
against him. Albani students would go visit him when they went to Saudi Arabia. And they were still with Bishak al-Albani. Do you see my point? Yeah. And there were many mashayikh like that. The Sheikh al-Albani had a mawqif harsh against them. But they, they didn't force his students to say, you, I don't see this person. As long as they're Salafi mashayikh, and they're Salafi, well, by the way, this is a condition. We're talking about Salafis who are ala aqeedat ahli sunnah. Ali, we don't say these ulama are mahsoom. Ali, you're right. We can discuss who's right or wrong in this situation. Not us. To reach the haqq. But to be honest, I don't see a lot of these brothers, what they say about these Salafi mashayikh that they take out of ahli sunnah. Ali, usool, fundamental issues that they left ahli sunnah. And I think what exacerbates the issue in our time anyway is the advent of social media and you see some statements on social media and you don't know how many thousands of people are going to be reading that and then retweeting this and going forward. What are some of the dangers that you can advise the people of, you know, even passing on information in the form of a retweet, let alone typing it yourself and then spreading it on the internet against some of the noble scholars? Well, like this issue of social media, I want to make a series on it. So inshallah ta'ala, I just, I do want to put that out there. Social media, I want to mention I mean, a lot about it. But it reminds me of an uh, issue of Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Imam al-Bukhari mentioned this. When Mu'awiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu took over and the issue got into his hand, like it was called Amr al-Jama'ah, the year where the Muslims united, Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. May Allah be pleased with him. And may Allah be pleased with Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Mm -hmm. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, sorry, Hassan bin Ali, you know, he went to Sham and he gave uh, Muawiyah a pledge of allegiance mm -hmm. and he said, look, uh, the matter is yours. I don't want to cause any fitna amongst the Muslims anymore. And the Prophet already prophesied that. He said, inna ibn hadha sayyid wa sayuslihu allahu bihi bayna fi atayni azimatayni min al-Muslimin. That this, my, my son here, yani Hassan, Allah is going to save through him yani, two large groups of the Muslims. The Prophet referred to both parties as Muslims. Mm. It's very important. Anyways, Hassan bin Ali bin Abi Talib, that's what he did. And after six months or so, he died. Okay. That year when Muawiyah took over and the Khilafah was given to Muawiyah, Abdullah ibn Umarin, his sister Hafsa came to him, which is the wife of the Prophet والسلام, And she's also the sister of Ali, Abdullah ibn Umar. He said, look, Muawiyah is taking over. And he's basically bringing the whole entire people together and to tell the people, I'm... Everything is my command. If you miss this gathering, it could be a problem. Go and sit there and listen to his khutbah. It shows you're united with them. Because people are, love you. They see you as a companion of the Prophet. They don't see in the gathering who is Furqan, Khilaf. So Abdullah ibn Umar went there. Mm -hmm. He sat down. When he sat down, he listened. Muawiyah said something which had a bit harsh statement in there. Muawiyah. Yeah. He said something very harsh. Um, which I'm sure I can explain when I do my lecture on social sure. media. Abdullah ibn Umar, in the narration mentions, he's he, there was a, a rope he tied on his legs. And when you sit down, you just stay tight. He's tight to it just to keep your legs like that. Where we sometimes do like our legs like that. He yeah. tied something on his leg. He said in the narration, he said that he said, I wanted to, un I wanted to open it. Stand up. And speak harsh to Muawiyah. I wanted to say to him, after what Muawiyah said, it was very harsh. He said, I wanted to say to him, yani, sitting here are the people who brought you and your father into Islam. Mm -hmm. With the sword, we brought you guys into Islam. They were sitting here when you didn't want to take Islam. Right? The battle of Badr and whatnot. Radiallahu ta'ala and whom I may love please with both of them. Abdullah ibn Umar. He didn't say it, which is the, one of the biggest lessons you learn from that. You might feel a certain way about something that was, that was, that was said by someone. You see it on a Twitter, or you see it on Instagram, or you see it on Facebook, or, or, the, or any other social media outlet. Everything you see, you don't have to respond to it. Mm. Yeah. You have to have the hikmah and the understanding that and it, because it causes khilaf, and it causes fuqa, and it causes division even more, and it's just... Honey, don't do that. Just be quiet. 
بما ما يلفظ من قول الا لديه رقيب عتيد الله سبحانه وتعالى ولقد خلقنا الانسان ولا اعلم ما توسوس به نفسه ونحن اقرب اليه من حبل الوريد اذ يتلقى المتلقي عن اليمين وعن الشمال قائل ما يلفظ من قول الا لديه رقيب عتيد ذات از نوت ا وورد ذات يو ات او اني ثينغ ذات يو سي از غانا بي يو غانا بي كويشن فور يوم القيامه ان ايفري ثينغ غانا بي بوت في يوم القيامه ديد يو سي ات الله تبارك وتعالى هي سيز ان هي ايه سوره كهف الله تبارك وتعالى هي سيز ذا باس سيز مالي هذا الكتاب لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة الا احصاها وجدوا ما عملوا حاضرا ولا يظلم ربك احدا ذا داي وير ذا باس اكشنز ويل بي بوت تو ذم اند ويل بي سيت تو ذم هي ذيس از اول يو ديد ذيس وات يو سيد ذيس از وات واز دان ذيس واز ذيس از ات All of his deeds are right in front of you that day. That's when you have to think about it. When you write, think 20 times before it, 50 times before it. Is it something I want to stand in front of Allah on the day Between you and Allah, that day is not a turjuman, a translator. Some people, they think what they write on social media, that they harm the person. And the person is now gone. What you say about him, it's gone. Is your khasmi on the day And uh, any other shaykh and ulama that you've spoken about, you're going to have to. Yani you didn't do a tahallulu min al madalim. Tahallulu min al madalim. You didn't free yourself from that person's rights. Yom al qiyamah, you have to have an answer for this man. And just in case someone asked, obviously, the, the hadith mentions anything that you say, things that you write on social media, that counts as, as things that you say, and that you're going to be held accountable for what you write on social media. And of course, at the time, the salaf, it might be something that you said to one person. Now, one tweet is like you've said it to 100,000 people, whoever Sorry. it goes to, whoever. Mm-hmm. It's very dangerous. Mm-hmm. And now, the, I, I do want this to be clear as well. I'm not saying there's right or the, everyone's right. And everyone, no, they're mm-hmm. right or wrong. Somebody might be wrong. But that being the case, you're not the fit person for to, as a person. You don't have that knowledge to say who's right or wrong. You're, you're muqallid. You did taqlid of one particular alim. Let's do it if you want to. I'm not saying you shouldn't. You've done taqlid of one alim in this issue and you take his opinion. Khalas. Lakin the muqallid is not allowed to force his opinion onto other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I want to take it back to the people at home who may be watching this and now they've gone through a journey where they've understood the value of knowledge, the people of knowledge, They want to now start seeking this knowledge. And you mentioned at the start that the, the advice that you'd give them is to have high aspiration and to come with sincerity, ikhlas. What about, and I know you've done many series and many lectures on this, and I'm sure people can search on our channel for lectures you've done in the past, but the methodology that someone should take in, or the practical methodology that someone can take in the 21st century to seek knowledge. You know, these questions, they're very beneficial, but sometimes it gives the impression to the listeners and it gives sometimes even to the person who's talking that, you know, I've reached the end. Mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, I've got knowledge. I mastered it. And I'm now talking to you guys. This is how I did it. This is how you guys can do it. And that's not the case. I myself admit, and I put my hand up and I, I, can, I consider myself to be the most lowest of low when it comes to knowledge. I, mean, I, have, I haven't got much understanding of the deed. But... I'm only mentioning what I read from the statements of the ulama, what they said in their work. So it's it's not my personal okay. yani, uh, way, it's not me. The scholars, they mention two things are required from a person when it comes to seeking knowledge. This is what the ulama say. The first thing they say is that the person has to have sifatun yanbaghi an yatahalla biha talibul Characteristics that the student needs to adorn himself with. There's qualities that you have to have. Ikhlas, sabr. If you're, not, if you're not patient, you're not going to attain knowledge. Whatever you're trying to do, if you don't have patience, you're not going to attain anything. Yani, there's hilm, forbearance. Yani, as-sidq fi talab al-ilm. As-sidq means that the person knows, or he, he, when he does seek knowledge, he doesn't, yani, he doesn't mix up seeking knowledge with other things. Knowledge, knowledge is big. It's you have big. to give it your full attention, otherwise it's going to be very difficult. Yeah. You so, can't, uh, you can't, you know, yeah, I see what you mean. Those are some of the qualities that you need to come with. Okay. And also, al-amal bil-ilm, act upon what you learnt. Because Allah, this is, this is uh, Allah's religion. When he sees that you've acted upon what he's given you, he's going to give you more. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, to, to take it yeah, bit by bit. This is a tadarruj. Mm. If you try to acknowledge all at once, it will go all at once. Um, 
So these are the, some of the qualities that the person needs to adorn himself with. Now we go into uh, the characteristics or the manhajiyah to fitalab al Now the second part is the methodology to seek knowledge. Okay. And so this first one I mentioned, which is a characteristics that you should come with, is the one that a lot of us, I myself included, we, we kind of dismiss and we push to the side. And when we were thinking about seeking knowledge, we just want to jump into the books and the teacher tells me about Masail and Yani, that's not. It's like uh, it's like that. It reminds me of you know when people go to the gym, yeah. and they say that your diet is such a big part of going to gym, but so, nobody cares about the diet. They just want to pump their weights and think this right. is it. This that's is it. it. Subhanallah. It's like that. It's exactly. Subhanallah. It's so true. Yeah, it's so true. They say, they say um, that uh, a good out outcome in the gym is made in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. That's in the kitchen. It's what you eat. Sahih. So yeah, people don't want to take that step and they feel like they come to, and again, when you come to the gym and you see Danny, a guy who's big and he's strong and he's got six packs on his ears, <laughs> you look at him and you start to think to yourself, that's how I want to be. Mm. So, so this is the guy, you know, I want to look like this. And if you ask the guy, how long have you been? 40 years, 10 years, five so years. So it worked, he took time. And he started at the small section. يعني, he started with a small 5 kg one, so, and then he made his way to the to the 30 kg. Or, يعني, I remember, subhanAllah, one time I was in the gym and I was doing like 5 kg, you know, small, small stuff. Yeah. And a guy came in and he looked around and he was like, yeah, I don't want to sign up for this gym. I overheard him. Yeah. And then, yeah, 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 so I don't want to sign up for this gym. <laughs> so it's <laughs> Arif. The guy goes, you know what, excuse me, why, sir? He goes, my weights are not here. His is so big it's that so, the gym hasn't even got it. The gym doesn't have it. Allah. So, but he started from somewhere. Yeah. You know, started from somewhere. So the person has to understand that there is a methodology when it comes to seeking knowledge. Okay. You can't just open a book and read from the middle page or rip a page out and think, oh, Allah, I'm just going to read this one script that I have. That's how some people see it. You have to start from the mutun. The scholars, they say, man hurimal usula, hurimal usula. If you're prevented from the beginner books, the small books, you're prevented from the big books. Mm. I subhanAllah remember at one point in my life, some of the mashayikh and the ulama I met, some of them will go to book fairs, they'll go to makatib, and guess what they would buy? Small mutun books just to put in their mm. pockets. And today, subhanAllah, we think a student of knowledge is the one who's got a trolley and he's putting all the books inside the trolley and he's got a big maktaba. It doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't necessarily mean sure. that this person's a a uh, grounded student of knowledge. I mean, yeah, doesn't really show much. The best person you see, Wallahi, when you look at a student of knowledge and you see an alim, you realize the small things when you ask him and the big things when you ask him, he knows the same. <laughs> like in some people, they talk about big things when you ask him, basic stuff, he goes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, it shows that there's a big gap. And it does affect your your, your 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 general knowledge. So start small. It's not a race. No one's running race. You don't have to just start the path properly and make your way slowly. And also get a sheikh, a person of knowledge, a person who understands it. Um, and uh, don't know that you can't do it by yourself. I mean, seeking knowledge from a book, just merely a book without a sheikh, it's like giving a person a new driver, a key to just drive the car. Mm. Can't drive, he's gonna kill himself. He's gonna hit a wall, he's gonna, hit, you know. He, if you wanna learn how to drive first, you have to take driving classes. And then you learn how the car works. This is a gear, okay, this is how it works, okay, good. This is the steering wheel, okay, this is how it works. There's a clutch, there's a brake, there's acceleration, there's a mirror, the maneuver, what But anyway, it's bit by bit, the teacher has to show you all of this. Yeah. If you just jump into the car and say, hey, everybody drives, I've got four legs, I've got four hands, I've got eyes, I've got ears, I can hear, it's the stereo, is this what they grab? Okay, let me grab it. You want to know the signs of the road, you want to know how to go about issues. Same with knowledge. And I don't, it shocks me that people don't tend to understand that. Uh, they don't understand that. Same with almost every science I told you say, like there's a lot of, it's true. Yeah. I know. So, um, you have to always try to I mean, take that methodology. The methodology 
inshallah ta'ala we've mentioned in great details in uh, yeah, in PDFs that I've, I've put together yeah. uh, also videos that we've done I think there's a series that we've done on this channel called Practical Steps okay. to Seeking Knowledge there's a few there's a few different playlists that we've got on Seeking Knowledge I'm sure people can find that inshallah ta'ala I think um, uh, the other thing that just to add on what you mentioned about the road being long is a beautiful statement from Sheikh Al-Albani which I'm sure you can say that um, how the path is, is long and we move a, across it so slowly but the goal is not to reach the end of the path it's to die upon it's it to die upon um, it. and that's, true. that's a very strong reminder for many people who might be struggling at this moment in time trying to progress their studies and even over the years of my life subhanAllah there were things I thought I would never be able to learn mm-hmm. and I thought this is, not, this is not for me and uh, I came back to it and read about it, studied it, learned with the shuyukh, asked them questions. And finally, you know, became a bit good about it, a little bit good in it. And so don't ever belittle your own efforts. Yeah. And don't ever think to yourself that I can't do this. Yeah, I, mean, I can't. Struggle, that's it, it's good. You know, it's those, I mean, yeah. what I can say is that for example, this is practical steps that people can understand. Okay. Like, for example, when you go to the gym, and uh, I don't know, this gym people don't think I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> gym buff. Yeah, yeah, they're gym yeah, they're, 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 <laughs> I go to the gym and stuff like that. I wish. But when you go to the gym and your muscles hurt you, and you go home that night, and your muscles hurt you, to get up in the morning to go work, mm-hmm. and to go in the next day to the gym again and work another part of your body, I need the mindset that you need to come with. Yeah, and just keep doing it. That's the same thing when it comes to Talib al You hit a wall, you think, oh, I can't do it, I can't, man. I'm not seeing any changes. Don't worry. Go on. Go on. Keep doing it. One or two mas'ala a day. If you learn it, you memorize one or two ayahs of Quran, you go through. Yani, if you don't have the shuyukh in your land, and it just, you know the Arabic language, go online, just take down, download the video, the audio, and listen to it. In each kalat that comes, ask senior brothers in you in the land. Yeah, brother Sheikh Nur Athaymin said this. I listened to his salat to the sword. He said this. I don't understand what does he mean by it. Yeah. And uh, of course, I think what puts off a lot of people as well is that they they feel like they can't see the progress on themselves. So it kind of like it's, it makes them give up. But it's one of those like anything really that because you're living it and you're seeing yourself day in, day out, you can't see the progress you made. But it's like, again, to bring it back to the gym example, or just use another example. Uh, mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah, Allah recently blessed us with a, with a baby daughter. Mashallah. People who saw the, my daughter when she was born and then saw her six weeks later, she's changed so much, yeah. wow. But to us, we see it every day, it doesn't look like the progress. Same with the guy in the gym. You see him three yeah. years apart, you're like, wow, you've been putting some work in the gym. But for him, it's just every day he sees himself that he doesn't really realize that he's actually making a lot of progress. I think a lot of the people seeking knowledge, what, it kind of makes them give up. They think, I'm not getting anywhere, but they actually are. Another thing I realized why a lot of people stop seeking knowledge uh, is because, and that's why I said at the beginning, sincerity. Mm. We're in a world today where if I do a little bit, I, I want people to approve it. I need people's yeah. approval. I need people to say, wow. So again, social media, instant gratification, everything. Yeah, and yeah well, I, it's... If I do something very small, I want to share it with the world and I want people to say, Allah, my jaw dropped. I'm amazed with you. And if the people don't say that to me, or I don't hear, I haven't, I haven't heard it in the last couple of days, people say that to me, I stop. And I sit back and I say, I don't want to do it. And so over time, your benchmark becomes the people. Mm. When they like it, you do it. If they don't like it, you don't do it. And so you don't live your life according to what is right from what is staying away from doing what is right and staying away from what is wrong. You don't. Your life becomes my followers, they want me to do this. My fa- you know, my friends, they they that. So everything that you're doing, push away the people mm. and remember Allah wa ta'ala. And wallahi, I'll be honest with you, I, I look at some of the mashayikh, yani the, the the scrutiny they went through and the criticism that they went through and the the way they were, they were, the way they, they were treated, it still didn't stop them seeking knowledge and authoring. Yeah, so at, at points where you think to yourself, Sheikh, like no one's reading your works, man. Are you, like, you've, you've been put through a lot. People have discredited you badly. Wallahi, it shocks you that, nope. Yeah. He kept, he kept, kept it going, and with sincerity, he prevailed. It really prevailed, and uh, and that's 
Like Bukhari, imagine if I was to say, like literally, this is what happened. Bukhari was what was alone, man. This man that you hear everywhere, and mm. if someone tells you Bukhari, like, yeah, yeah, you can attribute yourself to all these gawaif al mubtadi'ah. Still, Bukhari is some, honey, you know, respected. Another example, Al Imam Sibawayhi, rahimahullah, he died at the age of 32, 33. Wow. And they, he died because of a fitna that happened to him. Uh, it was a cause of that fitna. He became very sad and depressed because of that fitna. He went back to his, he left Iraq. He, ran, he left Iraq. He said, I don't want to be here. He went and he went to his land, Persia. When he went there, they said he stayed in his house. He didn't come out. Siba Wahi, Ali. Siba Wahi, that when we say his name, you know, sometimes it's not while you're alive. Mm. It's 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. People are still going to remember you with khair. Yeah. Yeah, make dua for you. You're not doing it because you want people to remember you. Like, like, that's right. But yes, you do want people to, to make dua for you. See, but we say, Rahimahullah, Rahimahullah. He, that's what I definitely want. 50 years from my entire life now, 100 years, if people can say, May Allah have mercy upon Abdul Rahman. That's all I need. That's all I would. I'm a, it makes me happy when someone says, Hafidahullah. I mean, it's something to be really happy with. And subhanAllah, it may be, is, and I believe it is, is those dua that the people, Amatul Nas, make for you is what I believe Allah protects me through. Mm. 32, he died. And then in his house, and his student, al Akhfash, said, Sheikh, you know, you've written a book, you haven't you know, finished it, but just give it to me. He took the book from him. And see what he did at last. Yeah, he died after that. He took that book. He brought it to the Muslims uh, in the world, and this kitab became, يعني, you know what it's called? It's called Al Kitab. Wallahi. It could have been if you read Al Kitab. <laughs> the book. The book. Yeah. The Sibwa's Kitab. And that is a, in, can we say that's an indication of his ikhlas, the fact that Allah, Allah, Allah gave him Kabul on this earth? La shaka, la shaka. Wow. Wow. I mean, so it's one of those things that you think about seeking knowledge is. From the outer, you really never know who's getting the most reward. You might have someone who's memorized the whole Quran, but another one who's struggling every single day, but because he's more sincere, he gets more reward than that, than the other one who's not sincere. Because you know the Kitab al Ba'un al Nawawi is 42 hadiths. Yeah. There's great scholars who wrote writ it before and after Nawawi. 42 had or 40 hadith in this topic, in this, in yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And Imam al Ajudri has a Kitab in 40 hadiths. Yeah. And Imam uh, wow. Nawawi has 42 hadiths. I always ask myself, yeah. and I'll be honest with you, the 42 hadith that Nawawi wrote seems like an easy job. Mm -hmm. It seems easy. From one perspective, it doesn't because it's he had to pick Jawami al kilim comprehensive yeah. speeches. But from the other works that Nawawi has done, this one is very small. Sure. And it's a doable work, to be honest. If you seek knowledge, you can do this. It's a very easy work to do. Why did Allah give his one acceptance? Yeah. This is where you ask yourself. Why? Why? Why this work? Shahid, something, you know, I, I go to this uh, markaz, it's called Markaz al Majid uh, in UAE. Okay. And I take manuscripts from it and stuff like that. And some of these books, you know, when I, when I get the manuscripts and I'm looking at the manuscripts, what I see is works that when you read the manuscript is very very hard and it's very very hard to read a manuscript this imam wrote it and he left it somewhere not knowing that it's many wars centuries happened. later that Khilafas came and went oh, that's still particular. lands got destroyed <laughs> but that manuscript remained that manuscript somewhere oh, right. and now centuries later in UK Canada America, people are mentioning Imam On Rashi electronic Muhammad. libraries. I'm carrying on my iPad wow. the book of this great Imam. And he, who would have thought that he, he, and he would have even been saved? It reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when you die, three things remain. One of them being? Yeah. Yeah. Knowledge that people knowledge. benefit. So if that isn't like an indication of how important and how virtuous, how much this could be doing for someone's day of judgment. And it's one of those things in, in, in the Deen of Islam where at whatever stage you are in your journey of seeking knowledge, you're getting rewards. Whether you're learning, you're getting reward for learning, as long as obviously you're sincere. When you're, you're implementing the knowledge you've learned, 
you get reward for that. When you're teaching the people, you get reward for that, and that gets carried, get that gets carried, 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 until who knows, many generations later, you're still getting rewards because of that. One powerful statement I recently came across. I'm starting to teach the Kitab Shabai al-Muhammadiya now. And a powerful statement touched me, which is, if you were prevented from seeing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in your dream, mm. then do not be prevented from seeing him by reading his, by his appearance and his features and the way he looks. If you couldn't see him in his sleep, at least see him in, while you're awake. Mm. But by reading his features and the way he looked, that is knowledge. You, you can always see the Prophet there. Yeah. Many of us wish we are, why, wish we would be companions and around the Messenger of Allah. So you have the opportunity. Might not be the way they did it, but you have the opportunity still. Um, I was taken back by narrations mentioned. I was like, how? How? They mentioned his beard was less than 20. Uh, the white hair in his beard was less than 20. And I, another narration mentions 17 or 18. Wow, that precise. That precise. So you can see how he looks by just studying his shama'il. Yeah. Knowledge makes you live with the Sahabas. You can live with the Prophet. Imagine that. And there you are. You've seen him by just studying this knowledge, gaining knowledge in this matter. Allah make us from the people of knowledge. Unless there's anything that you want to add to close up, any summary or anything? I think, uh, inshallah, we hope that people have found this beneficial. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.